Uh, well, the, uh, the business owner had his priest come by and drop in on him at, at work at his company. And the printed cartoon showed the one in clerical collar and one in business suit standing there looking out over a large room full of cubicles with drone-like workers at their tasks. And the caption read, You talk about resurrection, Father. You need to be here at quitting time. We are talking about resurrection, but we're not quite there, are we? We are starting the season of Lent, and it's the first Sunday of the season of Lent. Lent is preparation for Easter, like life itself is preparation for resurrection. Preparation for eternity. And we, the Bible says God has placed eternity in the hearts of human beings. And so we resonate with that. We want that. We feel like we're already connected with eternity because we are. The living God made us in His image. He's redeeming us in Jesus Christ from that brokenness of sin that plagues our lives. He says, I'll just redeem you out of that. He has and He is and He shall. We are in that process with Him and grateful for it. But Lent is preparation for Easter like life itself is preparation for resurrection. For resurrection. Now, we might think, well, aren't those seasons kind of a, you know, kind of a man-made thing that we don't really need to give much credence to? Well, how many of the things that we do day in and day out are just plain old man-made things that we're not really sure how important they are? These, above all, at least resonate with the biblical themes. Lent prepares us for a more meaningful Easter like life itself prepares us for resurrection. When we look at our life as preparation for resurrection primarily, then a lot of things make more sense. And a lot of things we think are horrible problems, insurmountable. I can never be happy because I have these negative things in my life. They suddenly begin to diminish in intensity because we know life is preparation for resurrection. This life itself that we are living out Preparation for resurrection. Let's consider that thought today as we prepare for resurrection and as we move together as a congregation toward Holy Week, toward the Passion, toward the Great Three Days, toward Easter Sunday, even as we know in parallel and in larger scope, life itself is preparation for resurrection. We don't have to be ultimately satisfied in these amazing ways all the time. We don't have to lament the fact that our bucket list is so long we'll never get around to all of it because this is not all there is. Life is preparation for resurrection. We taste it already, but one day it'll be here in reality. Jesus has already experienced it for us. Our lives are in Him. It's next on our agenda. Death and resurrection. Death has been defeated, and yet we are entering that season of Lent, which by design is about the grittier, more determined side of the faith. There is the free gift of grace claimed by faith, and then there is the faith made real by commitment, and that includes determination and grit and vigor. And so we recommit, we sign up all over again to journey toward the cross and through the cross to the empty tomb, knowing the huge importance the cross has for our lives and the validity given it by the empty tomb. So we prepare together for resurrection, even as we prepare for Holy Week and Easter, moving through this season of Lent. In this passage that we have considered together this morning that Barbara shared with us, <clears throat> we see a few principles or teachings that come out of this passage for us. Well, we prepare for resurrection by the way we live our lives as we move through Lent. This passage helps us in preparing for resurrection. We do so, firstly, by remembering who we are and who God is. <coughs> there is an insert in your bulletin that has an outline of some of the things I'm sharing with you this morning. We prepare for resurrection 
by remembering who we are and who God is. Now we are told in verse 1 that Jesus is coming into this wilderness temptation straight from having been baptized by John the Baptist at the River Jordan, but more important than that, by being baptized in a sense with the Holy Spirit as the dove came down or the Spirit came down in the form of a dove. <coughs> Excuse me. And the voice from heaven, His heavenly Father reminding Him who He was, who He is. We prepare for resurrection by remembering who we are, by remembering who God is. The devil approaches Jesus for these temptations using a little word, if, if. Before noticing that, however, note that still in verse 1, not only does he come from having been baptized, being reminded of his identity, and we are reminded of our identity when, when we reaffirm our baptism together too, aren't we? Well, there's also a double reference to the Holy Spirit in verse 1. It seems unnecessary, and yet there it is. So Luke, the writer of this gospel, this passage, the Holy Spirit leading him as he writes, wants us to know and to see and to receive this emphasis on the Holy Spirit. He was full of the Spirit, it tells us, and then the Spirit led him, or being full of the Spirit, the Spirit led him, into the wilderness. So this was not some happenstance. This was not some bad thing that happened to Jesus because God the Father was falling asleep at His post. No, this was part of the Spirit leading Him into a time of testing. We don't like to think of it this way, but much of life ends up being a kind of test that helps us to locate ourselves on how we're doing spiritually. How are we doing preparing for resurrection? Do we have our head and heart screwed on right as we move through life? Do our perspectives reflect those of God as revealed to us in the Scriptures? The Spirit leads Him into this time of wilderness testing and even temptation. Now the Spirit doesn't tempt Him, but the Spirit leads Him into this time in His life when the devil comes along and offers these temptations. He uses that little word if that I mentioned. <coughs> Excuse me. If I could stop coughing, I would really appreciate it. Uh, he uses this word, if, and the word used here in the New Testament or language that it was written in, it can go a number of ways. There is a way to use it that means this is not true, but if it were, thus and so. If this were true, we know that it's not, but if it were true, and then some hypothetical scenario is described. That's one way to use it. Another way to use it is, we know this is true. Since this is true, therefore, since A, therefore B. Being true, we know that thus and so. So on one hand, it's not true. On one hand, it's definitely true. The usage here is kind of in between those two. You see, the devil knows that he's the son of God. But he's hoping to plant seeds of doubt in the mind of Jesus. The devil knows he's the Son of God. So there is that since you are the Son of God. But he's hoping maybe he can stir up and plant and leave behind some seeds of doubt that will cause Jesus to question who he is in a way that becomes his detriment. If you are the Son of God, prove it to me. We're not really sure. So the usage here is right in between those two. The devil knows, but he hopes that Jesus will forget. Is the devil planting, sowing seeds of doubt in your life lately? Doubt can be a wonderful thing as we wade through and work through our doubts and emerge on the other side with a more mature faith. Don't be afraid of doubt. But let's not dwell there and wallow there and let it be to our detriment. The devil knows Jesus is the Son of God. So do we. Let's not receive and entertain those harmful seeds of doubt in our lives. We prepare for resurrection by remembering who we are and who God is. Who are we? We are children of the living God in Jesus Christ. He is our very life. 
He is our significance. Our life is in Him. We're not in Adam and Eve anymore. We used to be, but now we're not. We're in Jesus Christ. The God-man, the one who came and who did not succumb to temptation. There is a correlation in this passage with the Garden of Eden and the serpent tempting Adam and Eve. They failed. He didn't. Jesus didn't. Our life is in Him. His righteousness is credited to us. There is also a correlation with Moses and the Israelites in the wilderness 40 years. They failed. Jesus did not. He is the new man, the new humanity. He is the new Israel. He is the one who is our very life. He's the new you. He's the new me. He imputes His, Christ, His righteousness to us and He is our very life as we allow Him to live in and through us more and more, moving through Lent, but also through all of our lives, preparing for resurrection. Secondly, we prepare for resurrection by applying the Bible to our lives in ways that form us spiritually. We prepare for resurrection through spiritually forming reflection upon the Scriptures. Notice Jesus used, it is written, it is written, it is written three times to refute these temptations. He used the Bible. Now, was Jesus standing there in the wilderness with the Clint Eastwood whistling music in the background, twirling machine guns on his hands, firing Scripture verses at the devil as he came along? No, no. It wasn't just remembering Scripture. It wasn't just quoting it. It was deeply reflecting upon it. It was knowing the Scriptures, being steeped in the Scriptures, studying the Scriptures, memorizing the Scriptures, but most of all, reflecting upon the Scriptures in ways that form a person inwardly and spiritually from the inside out so that we're not desperately hurling Bible verses like some Bible-thumping gunslinger. We rather reflect upon the truth of Scripture. We seek to integrate it with other portions and aspects of the Scriptures, and we apply it in our lives in a variety of ways. We learn from life, and we take that back to the Scriptures. We run it through the grid of the Bible, and we begin to form a Christian mind so that we can evaluate the temptations of the tempter as they come our way. Yes, Jesus refuted temptation and the devil's work in his life with Scripture. But not just hurling Bible verses and phrases and magic words at him. It's because he reflected upon it and became spiritually formed from the inside out in his humanness from the inside out. We know He was the Son of God and is, but He was also fully human. And in that human side, He is formed from the inside out through His reflection upon the Scriptures. Now, we need a systematic way, and we largely have it perhaps, but if you don't, we need it and need to step it up of learning the Scriptures, of reflecting upon them, studying them, understanding them, applying them, yes, but reflecting upon them in a way that creates this kind of Christian mind so that we can discern and refute the deceptive temptations of life. As we're one of those is that we're preparing for resurrection. You see, that's the truth. The deception, the temptation is, I've got to accomplish everything in the world by tomorrow afternoon. Or I've got to be miserable because I can think of three or four negative things in my life. I'm not feeling too well today, so therefore all is lost. No, these short-term difficulties are the deception and the temptation. The reality is we're preparing for resurrection. And God will use everything that comes our way for good and for His glory as we prepare for resurrection. We do so by remembering who we are and who God is. We do so by being spiritually formed from the inside out through reflection upon Scripture. We're having a spiritual formation retreat event on March 16th, a Saturday, in the Shepherd Center. Gloria Wilson and other spiritual director 
uh, trained folks from across our conference will be here to lead in a few different workshops. And we'll, um, in addition to some worship and great fellowship, we'll also have three specific trainings on ways of getting Scripture into our lives in ways that form us spiritually. Not just head knowledge, but heart and spirit formation. March 16th, it's been in our newsletter. We'd love to see you there. Here's an opportunity in addition to Sunday school and Bible study, which is wonderful, wonderful. One more opportunity to be formed spiritually so that we, like Jesus, can use the Scriptures to discern and refute the temptations of life. Third, we prepare for the resurrection by applying this identity and theology that we have from the Scriptures. In other words, we take uh, remembering who we are and who God is, and we do that by reflecting upon the Scriptures. And as we're doing that, we take one more step and we apply it to these temptations in life. We might call them the unholy trinity. They are not God or even God's equal opposite, but they are basic and primal temptations in life. We want everything to be super simple, don't we? We love simple solutions, and there's certainly a lot to be said for simplicity. But I like the way the guy put it when he said, I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for simplicity on this side of complexity, but I'd give you my life savings for simplicity on the other side of complexity. And the Bible enables us to wade through it helps us and leads us in wading through the complexities of life, for we surely have them in our lives. Sometimes we are like the fellow who was telling his brother, or telling his friend rather, that he had been plagued with horrible hallucinations. He said, I just have terrible, I had terrible hallucinations. I couldn't sleep at night. I would lie down to go to bed and I would imagine, I would, I would hallucinate, and it seemed to me I was actually seeing them. These horrible, demonic creatures would come out from under my bed and prowl around the room all night long. I could hardly get any sleep, but thankfully, my brother cured me. And the friend said, oh, really, is your brother a psychiatrist? He said, no, he's a carpenter. He sawed the legs off of my bed. <laughs> we love simple solutions. Sometimes they work, and that's wonderful. But there is a fair amount of complexity to life. <clears throat> and the Scriptures are faithful. And the Lord is faithful to lead us through them victoriously. One of those temptations that Jesus experienced from the devil was satisfy your appetites. Satisfy your appetite. Turn this stone into bread. You're hungry. You haven't eaten for 40 days for crying out loud. Turn the stone into bread. You need it. Meet your needs. Satisfy your appetites. Peanut butter is really good, isn't it? You like peanut butter? Man, it's good. And sometimes I'm kind of like the, uh, or maybe you're kind of like the first grader who went to lunch at school and that day the stove and the oven were broken. They just weren't working at all and everybody got a peanut butter sandwich. Everybody. Walking out of the cafeteria in line to go back to class, this particular first grader was licking his lips and rubbing his tummy and he was heard to say, at last, a home-cooked meal. So maybe peanut butter is my stone into bread. Satisfy your appetites. Jesus responded in a sense, life is not appetite satisfaction. Life does not consist of bread alone. Man does not live on bread alone. In other words, you're defining life inaccurately. You're implying, devil, that I must meet this need simply because I feel it 
And if I don't, I'm failing miserably at life. Life does not consist of the meeting of appetites, certainly not alone. Life is not appetite satisfaction. It's bigger than that. It's grander than that. It's deeper than that. It's more profound than that. Life is preparation for resurrection. It is spiritual at its core. We have temptations physically in our physical appetites of hunger, of desiring certain foods perhaps we shouldn't eat. We have temptations financially to worry, to wring our hands, to allow our finances to control our lives, to control the essence of our being, to cheat, perhaps to steal in subtle ways, to worry at least. These appetites extend to the sexual realm. Meet your needs. These are needs. Go meet them. They even extend in taking care of ourselves and meeting our needs in our appetites. It even extends into our late-in-life discouragement that may happen sometimes. Dr. Bruce Larson describes his mother as having been a wonderful, joyous, vibrant, inspiring Christian lady But in the last few years of her life, he said that she changed. He said she decided that God didn't know what He was doing. She should have died by now, and there was no sense that she was still hanging around. She was uncomfortable. Life wasn't fun anymore compared to the way she had been used to living. And God just was wrong and didn't know what He was doing in that she was still hanging around. And so she became embittered about that. And, and really became distanced from the God she'd walked with all of her life. She still knew of God. She still trusted Him generally. But she did not trust Him in this regard that began to loom large in her life and resulted in a certain amount of bitterness. And that's really what's at heart here, isn't it? May we trust God. The devil said... Not only satisfy your appetites, but also be successful no matter what. Be successful no matter what. I will give you all the kingdoms of the earth. They are mine to give, and I'll give you their glory and authority. There's an interesting emphasis here. It's on the word you. The devil is saying to Jesus, like some pushy salesperson, To you, you, imagine it. Not to your friend, not to the guy down the street, not to somebody else, but to you. You've been waiting for your ship to come in. You've been waiting for this. You know you deserve it. For you, imagine it. Just imagine yourself with all of these riches. To you, I will give all the kingdoms of this world. And he emphasizes their glory, and their authority. Their authority. You'll be your own boss, your own king. Everyone will bow down to you or at least look up to you. You'll have glory and authority. All of these kingdoms of mine are mine to give. Well, that's not true. That's not true. You see, the tempter cannot even be trusted to put the temptation accurately. He's deceiving us even in the way that He frames the temptation. All the kingdoms of of this world are not His to give. He's on a leash. Sometimes it seems rather long, but He's on a leash. And He's talking to the one who already truly had all the kingdoms here and eternally. More than the devil could imagine. And so do we in Christ. Christ is our life. We're preparing for resurrection. And so the strength of temptation begins to fall apart and to slide away from us because we see the deception in the way it's being framed. Our life is in the One who truly owns the greatest kingdom of all. And we are there with Him now and eternally. We're preparing for resurrection. 
Jesus said, worship and serve God only. Worship and serve only God. Jesus saw through this temptation to be successful no matter what, to have all kinds of success and the trappings of success and glory and authority that Jesus had and would have even more of. But the devil is sort of encouraging him to take a shortcut. Why go through all that? If you won't fall, fall for my temptation on, at face value, at least hear me out when I say, we know you're going to get glory and authority. Why make it difficult? Why go through the cross to get the crown? Take a shortcut. It's all the same. It leads to the same place. Jesus equated that with worshiping Satan. Worship and serve only God. Don't serve the devil. Don't worship the devil. Don't worship and serve material gain, success. Shortcuts are often dead ends. Not always. Sometimes we just need to cut through the clutter and not waste our time with a lot of truly unnecessary things. So sometimes that's a good God-given thing. But a lot of times the devil tempts us with shortcuts. Shortcuts as if there aren't ethical and moral ways of going about life that really matter. Shortcuts are often dead ends that Jesus equates with worshiping the devil. Finally, the devil said, Jesus, get the attention you deserve. Let's go up on top of the highest point of the temple and throw yourself down on the side that would have you tumbling down into the Kidron Valley the most dangerous place from which a person could fall from the top of the temple. Just cast yourself off. Fling yourself off the temple. Because, and here the devil quotes the Bible. The devil quotes the Scriptures to Jesus and says because he will send his angels and he will catch you and you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus says don't selfishly test God. Get the attention you deserve. Everyone will be amazed as you throw yourself from the temple and angels come to catch you. There will be no doubt as to who you are. Well, the devil knew who he was and thankfully Jesus had no doubt as to who he was. He didn't need the extra adulation. How much attention do we have to have how much spotlight do we have to have? And why are we not secure in the Lord Jesus Christ and in God's love for our lives? Jesus said, don't selfishly test God. Sometimes we can have a pity party and we selfishly test God within our own thoughts and feelings and we say, you must not care about me. If you did, you would make all the little details go my way. And God says, I'm not going to play that game. I love you. I've decided to love you. I love you to the nth degree. The cross shows us that much. How much attention and spotlight do we have to have? Jesus says, don't selfishly test God. All of these temptations have to do, as did the serpent's temptation in the garden, with distrusting or mistrusting God. Does God really care? If God really cared, then these things wouldn't happen. If God really cared, the, the tempter puts those seeds of doubt in our minds. And we are then, we feel like we're moved to the need to be independent of God because God either doesn't know what He's doing or He can't be trusted. doesn't really care. And so a wedge is driven in between us. And we have the need then, we feel it, to be self-serving and independent. And after a while, we're miles away from God. And life is more difficult than it's ever been before. The devil does not deliver on his deceptive promises. There were a couple of twin boys who grew up together and thoroughly enjoyed each other's company. And were, as many twins are, they were identical and as many twins are. They would finish each other's sentences. They seemed to know what each other were thinking. They inherited their father's store. They ran that store together with great delight. And one day a customer came in, made a small purchase and 
gave a dollar bill in payment for the purchase. One of the twins took it and placed it on top of the cash register and walked the customer to the door and bid him farewell as he walked down the street. He slowly made his way back to the cash register and noticed that the, the dollar bill was gone. And he confronted his brother. He said, I guess you got that dollar bill off the top of the cash register. No, I didn't. He didn't know what he was talking. No. And he said, well, there's no one else in the store. Uh, I didn't get it. You had to have gotten it. So would you just put it in the cash register? I did not take the dollar bill. And they went on and on. And this delightful partnership and brotherhood was rent asunder to the point where they built a dividing wall down the middle of the store. Each of them now operated their own stores. There were two stores now side by side for 20 years and never spoke to one another during that time. Finally, one day, a man came in, parked his car out front, came into the store and said, have you been in business here for a while? And he said, yes, about 30 years. He said, oh, great, great. 20 years ago, I was in here and I, or I was walking by the door, the side door over there. I had just gotten off a freight train. I was a vagrant and a wanderer across the countryside, a homeless hobo. And I saw you going toward the door with a customer and that I came in and I got that dollar bill and I put it in my pocket and I left before you saw me. And I have come to know the Lord since then. I'm a Christian man. I really was raised that way and I kind of got away from it. Now I'm back in it and the Lord would really have me come and find you. And I know it's not much. It's just a dollar, but I need to give you this dollar back. Will you accept that and forgive me? With tears welling in his eyes, the brother said, would you walk with me next door? Will you tell that story to my brother? And as he did so, and amid many tears, these twin brothers who loved each other deeply were reconciled. Their relationship had been divided for all those years because of mistrust. Mistrust. Is God faithful? Is He trustworthy? Does He love you? Do the things that happen in our lives that we'd rather not happen, do they prove God can't be trusted? No, they don't. No, they don't. God does love us. And He uses everything in our lives to prepare us for resurrection. To prepare us for resurrection. I close the outline with these bold printed statements. God is lovingly faithful to provide our sustenance, the bread, our purposeful accomplishment, our success, and personal significance now and eternally. Temptation lures us into independence from God through mistrust and self-determination. Our joyful victory lies in renewed submission and trust in God's love and faithfulness. Let's journey together as we continue preparing for resurrection. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank You that You are preparing us for resurrection, for a, for a glorious life, the bounds of which we can't even imagine. Thank You, Lord, for loving us, for being a good God in our lives. And You are God, Lord. We are not. And it's each one of us, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. For temptations do come, and often we succumb. We confess, O oh God, anything Your Spirit brings to us right now that we need to confess, to agree with You, to acknowledge in our lives. We thank You for Your full and complete forgiveness. We thank You for stealing our souls in the sense of strengthening them, for forming us spiritually against the deceptive temptations of the evil one. Help us see through them to discern their weakness, to see that they don't measure up. They don't hold a candle to You. Thank You, Lord. You truly do have all glory and authority. And You have claimed us as Your own. Thank You, Lord, for preparing us for resurrection. Lord, we lift to You those folks of our number who are sick, who are dealing with great difficulty, even as we speak. Lord, we lift up those 
deeply missing loved ones who have died, grieving. And Lord, we lift up each one of our predicaments and problems that we face in the coming week. Speak to us, Lord. Fill us, Holy Spirit. Lead us into that wilderness ahead, knowing that You are with us, even as You prepare us for resurrection. Thank You, Lord. Thank You for giving Yourself for us, showing Your love. Lord, we respond by giving to You our whole lives and selves anew and afresh this day by demonstrating the same in the giving of Your tithes and our offerings. Thank You, Lord. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen.